Welcome to Conversations from the Couch. I'm here today with Dr. Marty Klein. I'm Leah Brick, Executive Director for SASH, and I'm so excited to be with Dr. Klein and talking more about his presentations. Dr. Klein, you're a sex therapist and you've written a lot of books. You've lectured just a tremendous amount. And I'm wondering if you could tell us more about your work. Well, first you have to call me Marty, okay? Okay, that's a deal. Great. Okay. Thank you, Leah. Leah, thank you for, uh, for having our conversation like this. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm so excited to be doing this with Sash, but first things first, you asked me about my work, so I'm going to tell you about my work. I've been a licensed marriage and family therapist since 1980, kind of before you were born, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and a certified sex therapist. And I've spent my whole uh, career uh, researching sexuality, studying it, uh, doing my clinical work, traveling around the world. I've been very fortunate traveling around the world, talking to um, uh, therapists and policymakers in uh, a lot of different places and doing, uh, doing work for the courts. I've been an expert witness in uh, state and federal courts, even one international uh, trial in South Africa. Uh, talking about um, the kinds of uh, sexual behavior that are common, the kinds of sexual behavior not so common, and uh, the kinds of conversations that people need to have about sexuality so that they can have uh, better relationships, better lives, parent their kids better, and, um, and uh, create more humane, life-affirming policies around sexuality in whatever country I happen to be speaking in. Mm -hmm. So you have written and lectured a lot, a number of books, and on the topic of problematic sexual behavior. And why do you think, besides you talked about parenting, um, legislature, and certainly other countries, why is sexual, the, that topic, the problematic sexual behavior is such an important topic, do you think, to the world, but also to us as human beings? Well, I'm glad you asked me that, Leah. Um, you know, uh, sexual satisfaction and problematic sexual behavior, kind of two sides of the same coin. And so anyone who's interested in one is generally interested in the other. More importantly, perhaps. Um, in my very first book, all the way back in um, uh, 1988, uh, I, wrote about, I wrote about what I called at that time normality anxiety, a phrase that didn't quite take off in the popular culture. But <laughs> um, I, there's so much pressure in, in Western culture, for sure. There's so much pressure on people to feel sexually normal. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people are afraid that they're not. A lot of people, they get messages when they're growing up that they're too interested in sex or that uh, they get the idea that their fantasies aren't normal or their desires aren't normal. They're too sexy. They're not sexy enough. A lot of confusion about what's normal sexuality. And so by the time people get to be adults, a lot of people are concerned that they're not sexually normal. And... Um, Part of what we see um, uh, that comes under the rubric of problematic sexual behavior is maybe a little unusual, but, um, but it's, it's not damaging to anybody and it doesn't, um, um, it, it doesn't contradict people's values. And so in that regard, it's not problematic, but people are concerned. Mm -hmm. People have so much pain about um, the way that I orgasm, um, it works for me, but if other people knew, you know, they'd think that I was weird. Or um, I'd love to talk to my partner about maybe some new position or new way of connecting sexually, but what if, what if they think I'm weird? So at least from that perspective, there's a lot of concern about what is or is not problematic sexual behavior. And now with the internet, um, uh, which is a gigantic library of human sexual fantasy. Right. Uh, people are really concerned about, about their fantasies, about their partner's fantasies. There's all this sexual activity that goes on online 
that nobody ever really thought about doing before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can actually, with your mouse, you can arrange to have sex with an octopus if you want now. So, you know, is the desire to see yourself having sex with an octopus, is, is that problematic? Is that something that needs to be fixed? Is that something that a person needs to be ashamed of? So, and, and as you yourself said, Leah, that doesn't even begin to talk about our concerns about our kids, our kids uh, learning the stuff that they need to learn. How do we provide the sex education at home, at school, in the community that young people need? So I've been working on this topic for a very long time, and um, it's endlessly fascinating, and uh, there's such a big need for it. Well, and I, I think your points are really well taken and speak to just sexual health in general, right? So it's, it's one of the subjects that we don't necessarily talk about. Sometimes sexual health is pigeonholed into reproductive health or STIs or what some people call STDs. Um, but it's so much bigger than that. Why do you think that having a conversation about sexual health is important, not just for partners and people who are in an intimate relationship, but why is it important for me to have that conversation with my child? Oh, well, that's an easy one. We want our children to grow up to be healthy, strong, have a sense of agency in their own lives. We want our kids to grow up to know what they want. We want our kids to grow up to have good values and to be able to enact those values. We want our kids to be able to say to somebody, here's what I want. We want our kids to be able to say to somebody, here is what I don't want. And we want our kids to have a, a sense of themselves so that um, they don't need to go along with the crowd in order to feel they're okay. And they don't need to be terrified that they're gonna be abandoned if um, they stand up for their values. So all that stuff comes into play when we talk about how do young people make good sexual decisions. Mm -hmm. And young people need to be prepared for the kinds of complicated situations that they're gonna find themselves in sexually. And unfortunately, some parents think that uh, you have one conversation with your kids and you're done, which would be like saying, well, a good parent has one conversation with their kids about nutrition, and then they're done with that subject. Right. But what's true is that you teach your kids about nutrition when they're five, you teach them again when they're eight, you teach them again when they're 11, and so on. And the conversations we have at five, which might be no candy 20 minutes before dinner, that conversation is great when a kid is five, but when a kid is 12, they need a much more complicated conversation about nutrition. And it's the same thing with sexuality. The, the things that kids need to know at five obviously don't include uh, how to use a condom, right? The things that kids need to know about, uh, about sexuality at five are pretty basic. They include proper words for body parts, right? For example. Uh, so you could have the, the, the perfect conversation with a five-year-old about sexuality, uh, but two years later, you've got a totally different kid on your hands. And so you need to have a different conversation with them. Sex education uh, is not an event. It's a very long process. And, and it, even includes, it even includes when, um, when dad is at the, at, the, at the sink washing dishes and mom comes along and pats him on the butt, that's sex education too. And conversely, when we're at the dinner table and somebody refers to some neighbor lady down the street as a slut, that's sex education too. Right. Oh, there's so much that kids need to know about sexuality in order to be healthy and powerful and, um, and self-actualized. And of course, that's our goal uh, for, for our kids no matter who we are, we all want our kids to grow up to be strong and healthy. Right. And, and I really appreciate that you're talking about that across their youth, across their lifespan, but it also includes into our lifespan, right? Into our adult lifespan. So if I'm not educating my son 
at five and 12 and even at 17 and maybe even into 20s because when your children leave for college, you have less control than when you're, they're living in your house. So if I'm not having those conversations with them all across those different time periods, then I'm not preparing them, I hear you saying, to have those conversations with their partners, their intimate partners as adults. And so, you know, that's why uh, I, I hear you saying that it's so important to not only have a sexual health or sex education conversation, but to really understand what's problematic, what's not problematic, and what's problematic for me may not be problematic for you, and to learn some of those, those differences for ourselves and to respect other people's limits on those as well. Right, and just one more thing about kids since, since you brought this up. Um, parents are asking me all the time, how do I talk to my kids about pornography when they're 13 or 12, 12 13 years old? And based on the conversation that you and I are having, you can see that you really don't want the first conversation with your kids about sex to be about pornography. You know, you want to be talking about sexuality from the time that they're little, very little, so that by the time you get to talking to them about porn, whether it's at nine or at 13 or at 15 or whatever age that happens to be, it's not the first conversation you're having with them and you don't have to start from scratch, right? You're right. Building Building, building, building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of problematic behavior and um, your work, tell me more about your post-conference. You're doing a post-conference for SASH that is three hours long. It's on Sunday, October 18th. Tell us more about that. Oh, I'd love to. I'm so excited about this. Um, so as you know, uh, we were talking about um, me participating in that fabulous panel with, uh, with Eli and Alex on Saturday, which I'm sure we're going to talk about. And, um, and, and uh, I said, well, you know, would you like me to do something about pornography? And you jumped on that and we talked about it and figured out, yeah, let's do this post-conference thing. So um, I'm going to be talking uh, to clinicians and policymakers if, if they choose to join us anyone who's interested in pornography, what's the latest research on um, who uses it? What do they look at? Um, what are they actually seeing? And uh, most importantly, from the clinician's point of view, what do you do when you have an individual or a couple come in and there's uh, trouble around pornography? I work with a lot of couples, a lot of couples where um, one person is unhappy about the other person's porn use, and we're going to talk a lot about that. And I work with a certain number of individuals who come in and they're concerned about their own porn use. They're concerned that, uh, um, that they're watching too much. They're concerned about the content of what they use. They're concerned about the fact that they're keeping a secret from their partner or that um, they've already had a few blowups with their partner and they promised they wouldn't do it. And now they're doing it again. So I'm going to talk about, um, the reality of pornography in people's lives. And I'm going to be talking about what today's clinician can do when pornography is the subject of the clinical conversation. What do you hope that the attendees walk away with? What's the nugget that you really want them to get out of the post-conference? You know, it's terribly cruel to limit me to one nugget, Leah. <laughs> All right. Give us a couple then. Oh, Okay. <laughs> well, let's see. Um, one nugget that I want people to walk away from, uh, away with is um, that whatever clinical tools we have, whatever tools we have to deal with people in general, those are the tools that we should be using to deal with clients or patients who are talking about pornography. We don't need a special set of tools. We don't need a special vocabulary. We don't need a special set of ethics. For, for therapists who know how to do therapy, for couples counselors who know how to do couples counseling, or for psychotherapists who know how to do psychotherapy, just do that same stuff when the subject is pornography. That's the number one nugget I want people to walk away from. 
The number two nugget I want people to walk away from is um, I want to help uh, people get more comfortable actually talking about pornography as a reality, not as some abstract uh, phenomenon out there, but rather how to talk about the same way that we hope that uh, patients can talk, uh, that therapists can talk with patients about, let's say, um, cancer. You know, a uh, patient has breast cancer, uh, they're grieving about that, or somebody's partner has cancer, how do they deal with that? We talk about that in a very down-to-earth way, right? We talk about the diagnosis, the prognosis, we talk about grief, we talk about um, maybe hiring somebody to take care of your partner periodically, if that's part of the game plan. Sure. Um, similarly, um, somebody has a kid who's going away to college. How do we deal with that? Well, you know, the, is it in part of the empty nest syndrome? Is it um, grief about losing a member of the family? Is it anxiety about is the person properly prepared, the young person, to leave? Um, is it I'm concerned what's going to happen between me and my, uh, my husband or my girlfriend now that the kid is gone and there's no buffer between us. So uh, life situations come up and as counselors, as therapists, we deal with them in a very practical, tangible way. In addition to the, the deeper uh, psychotherapeutic stuff, that's how I want people to be uh, talking with patients about pornography. What do you watch? What are you concerned about? Um, do you watch on a screen? Do you look at magazines? Um, do you masturbate while you're looking? Do you not masturbate while you're looking? Um, if, you if you masturbate while you're looking, do you have an orgasm? Do you like how it feels? How much time do you spend? Really practical things. Mm -hmm. Rather than seeing uh, pornography as this abstract thing over there that I certainly don't know very much about. So that's two nuggets. I, I really appreciate all of that. And I, I still see in clinicians who are not particularly in our field, in, in the sexual health field, still drop their voices and into a whisper almost anytime they start talking about sex or porn or or any of those issues that might need to be explored that could or could not be problematic for their patient, but really need to be underscored and looked at, and yet they're they're in a whisper in their conversation. So I I hope that we that your attendees really get um, that message because it's so important to, to know how to have that conversation with your clients and, and to have some sort of comfort level with it, even with your own discomfort. Yes. And um, whether, whether any given client or couple is going to talk about pornography or even sexuality, um, if they have the feeling that they can't talk about that with you, that compromises all of the therapy. It doesn't just compromise the part of the therapy that's about sexuality. Because mm -hmm. any patient who has the feeling of, well, yeah, Dr. Jones is like really great, but you know, Dr. Jones, there's certain things you can't talk about. I mean, wouldn't, wouldn't you, the average therapist, just be aghast to, to know that your patient feels that way? Well, once a patient feels like there's certain things that you can't talk to Dr. Jones about, that gives them the idea that every topic, they have to be wary about taking care of the therapist's feelings. They have to be concerned about, now we've never talked about religion or we've never talked about um, physical health or we've never talked about one thing or another. If I bring that up, is the doctor going to be upset? If I bring that up, is the therapist uh, going to think that I'm a troublemaker? So, it's really important, even if the therapy has nothing to do with sex, it's really important that patients feel that if they want to bring that up, they can. Yes, absolutely. And Leah, there's just one more thing about pornography that I want to mention. Apparently, I didn't make this up, apparently, about three quarters of American men look at pornography at least once a month. Three quarters, three quarters of American men look at pornography um, at least once a month. What that means is that statistically, statistically, the very next male patient 
who walks into a therapist's office, regardless of what the presenting problem is, statistically, the chances are that patient looks at pornography. Now, I have no problem with that. Hopefully, no therapist has a problem with that. But if a therapist has a problem with that, they need to realize that they have a problem with the behavior of the very next patient who's walking into the office. Mm -hmm. Therapist needs to think about how do you want to run your practice if you're going to problematize uh, the very next guy who walks into the office. Mm -hmm. Complicated subject, I understand, and different therapists are going to have different um, theoretical orientations about this. Sure. But let's say it out loud. The very next guy who walks into your office probably, not definitely, but probably looks at porn at least once a month. Think about that. Yeah. So you mentioned different theoretical approaches. That leads us to the panel that we're having on Saturday that you're sitting on. You mentioned that with Dr. Alex Katahakis and Dr. Eli Coleman. What excites you about being on that panel with our other esteemed guests? All that I get to talk. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Did I say that or did I think that? (laughs) Um, I'm I'm excited about... um, I'm excited about being able to present uh, my vision of how do you actually work with people um, with problematic sexual behavior. And I'm excited to have the chance uh, to answer questions from the other panelists and from the audience, right? Um, I've known Eli um, almost 40 years. Um, Eli and I uh, uh, were uh, served on the board of the Society for the Scientific Study of Sex for many years. And in fact, Eli and I did a, a historic panel, uh, again, uh, before you were born, uh, Leah. Eli and I and Pat Carnes and um, uh, somebody else, uh, Barbara Huberman, I think it was, we, we did a panel on sex addiction all the way back in uh, 1989, I think. I mean, it was a really long time ago. Um, it was a plenary panel at an ASEC meeting, about six or 700 people were there. And um, so uh, I've spoken to Eli, you know, many times since uh, 1989. Um, and his thinking has evolved, my thinking has evolved. And uh, it's always, I, he's just one of the smartest people on the face of the earth. So um, I, I always learn something just listening to Eli, even if I ask him, you know, directions about how to get someplace. I always learn something from Eli. I don't know Alex as well. Obviously, she's well respected. So um, I'm flattered to be uh, to be invited to sit between these two people. And we're really grateful for the three of you joining us. It really leads to our vision in SASH, and that is to be able to have open conversations that are thoughtful and maybe not always in agreement, but certainly thoughtful with each other and uh, so this panel is just the start of, of many that we hope to have in, in the future. So as we close out our conversations, uh, tell me how our folks watching can learn more about your work. Where should they go to hear and see more about your work? Oh, well, thank you for asking. As you know, I have a website, uh, www.sexed.org, hold up sign with website, right? Uh, <laughs> sexed.org, S-E-X-E-D dot O-R-G. As you know, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, um, I've written seven books about sexuality. In, um, my most recent one is about pornography. That I actually can hold up. That's um, His Porn, Her Pain, right? My new book. Fantastic. Um, Confronting America's Porn Panic with Honest Talk About Sex. That's my new book. The book before that was uh, Sexual Intelligence. Oh, I can hold that up too. How cool is this? Oh. Don't fall out of your chair. Don't fall out of my chair. Uh, sexual Intelligence, right, from HarperCollins. Um, so my website, um, I, as you know, I do my Sexual Intelligence blog um, every week or two, always about sexuality. And then I have a monthly electronic newsletter, 249 consecutive months. I'm exhausted. Uh, so, um, and now apparently I have a YouTube channel and apparently I'm doing a little video quickie every Friday. We'll see how long I keep that up. I don't know if I'll do that 249 times, but um, so every week uh, I publish a little six, seven minute video uh, quickie 
on a subject um, uh, about desire or um, uh, I did one called uh, I'm tired of erections. Well, I'm tired of, of some erections. Um, I did an open letter to my physician uh, about sexuality. I did a little video clip, uh, an open letter to my doctor and yours about sexuality. So um, if you go to YouTube, um, just uh, search on my name and apparently uh, you get all, all sorts of little uh, video clips about sex. So, um, so thanks for asking, Leah. And um, of course, it's very easy to get a hold of me. Uh, my uh, email address is uh, all over my website. And uh, I love to hear from people telling me how much they love my work. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today. And we really look forward to seeing you at the conference and appreciate again, you doing the post conference for our folks. And I, I just want to thank you for being a part of our conversations from the couch and helping us to have thought provoking conversations and, and to really um, help people get educated that might not otherwise have the information that they need. So thank you so much. Thank you, Lee. It's really been a pleasure. And I appreciate you uh, being such an effective executive of such an important organization. Uh, thank you.